Giuliano. I am the curator of the Yolo County Historical Collection. Uh, welcome to the Barn Gallery. We are here um, exploring uh, the speaker series with the goal of, of exploring ideas relevant to our community. Uh, we would like to open today's event by acknowledging the land on which we are gathered. For thousands of years, this land has been home to the Papuan people, including the Yochadiki Winta Nation. The Papuan people have remained committed to the stewardship of this land for over many centuries. It has been cherished and protected as elders have instructed the young through generations. We are honored and grateful to be here today on their traditional lands. A few upcoming events that we want to tell you about. Um, it's Last Chance at Gallery 625, The Photographer's Moment, located at Yolo County Administration Building at 65 Court Street from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Monday through Friday. Thursday, June 23rd, Vibr Vibrant Exploration Works in Representational Abstraction, opening reception at the Barn Gallery at 5.30. Thursday, July 21st, Salon Series, Manuel Rios and Omar Arison, co-curators of, of Vibrant Exploration, works in representational abstraction, also at the Barn Gallery at 5.30. And then on view, August 2nd at Gallery 65 is Wonderlust. So we'd like to introduce you today to our speakers, Linda Fitzgibbon and myself, Yulia Bodanu. Um, Linda was born in New York and has been a Yolo County resident and artist for over 30 years. Her ceramic artwork uh, is often inspired by the produce of the Central Valley. She has an MFA in Visual Arts from Lesley College of Art and Design and a BA from Yale University. She is an art adjunct faculty at Consumnes River College and has curated exhibitions at CRC Art Gallery including Empathy in 2019 and Real ID in 2022. As a long-term teaching artist of Yolo Arts, she runs a ceramics program in Esparto Elementary and also services other local schools. Uh, Fitzgibbon's artwork is in the collection of the Crocker Art Museum, the UC Davis Minetti Shrem Museum, the Arizona State Museum in Tempe, uh, the Butler Institute of American Art in Ohio, the Yale University Art uh, Gallery in Connecticut, and publications include Confrontational Ceramics, 500 Figures in Play, Volumes 1 and 2, Ceramic Arts and Perception, and Ceramics Monthly. So we're here. Thank you so much, Linda, for joining us. And um, we will be exploring themes of creating ceramic art and curation. So um, as we start off today, um, a little bit about myself as well. I am the curator of the Yolo County Historical Collection. Um, and. Um, the curator of the Gibson House. I have a master's in museum studies from San Francisco State University um, and have been with the county for four years. So it's a pleasure to interview Linda today. <laughs> all right. Um, and thank you all for attending today. Um, we're going to sort of start asking Linda about her background in ceramics and sort of an overview um, of her career and sort of where her interest in ceramics started. So, yeah. Linda. Well, first of all, I want to thank you so much for inviting me to, to be here and to talk about my work. And uh, it's been really fun working with you on the side by side show and, um, you know, being part of that exhibition. And um, you pointed out that I teach in the community, and I feel like that is a big driving force. Um, for me, I actually uh, grew up in a, a family of artists and my mom was a teacher and I never really thought about going in that direction. It just sort of became my path. And um, so, um, but talking about how, I guess, how I wound up doing what I'm doing, which is just such a, a pleasure um, to finally arrive at the medium that um, I chose because it, it wasn't an immediate thing. I never thought of myself as an artist when I was growing up. I always carried around a sketchbook, but my sister was the artist. Mm -hmm. And I really, my passion was music. And so it, uh, when I went to school, when I went to, off to college, I uh, took um, art history and music, and I was also fascinated with the Middle Ages. So I wound up um, working at the Cloisters one summer, and my dad was a madman on Madison Avenue. So in addition to being dragged around to museums, 
Um, I also was fascinated by the books on type and just works on paper. Um, so I may have taken some ceramics in high school, but, but I didn't actually find clay until I had, um, many years later, uh, arrived in California. Mm -hmm. And what so. was that interaction like, sort of when you encountered clay or started working in clay? Was it, um, you had already set your mind up to be an artist at that point, or was it? No, no, not at all. Um, yeah, so in between graduating from college with a double degree in art history and music, mm -hmm. I went into publishing and was a graphic designer. And so um, between 1980 and I arrived in 88, I guess, with a daughter in tow, mm -hmm. um, lived in, so got married right out of college. Um, my husband was doing medical training in Chicago after I worked for a year at Harry Abrams designing art books. Um, then I worked in publishing in Chicago and um, so encountered the Harry Who, went to a lot of museums. Um, my father, ex-father-in-law um, was an art collector, uh, art historian, so we just gravitated in our spare time to visiting you know, all the museums in Chicago. So um, by the time I left Chicago, I had a one month old, and um, we landed in Davis, and I was still designing books um, through my third child. So I had three children in four years. Goodness, yeah. <laughs> so, um, and you know, just being in uh, California, having come from New York and Chicago, making my way west, I think one of the, besides being a new mom, one of the first things that really impressed upon me being here was the, the California funk movement in ceramics mm -hmm. and um, the produce and just the amazing things that grow in the Central Valley. Mm -hmm. I mean, in Chicago, there's just not a lot of farmer's markets, at yeah. least there weren't when I was there. Mm -hmm. um, so just the wild and wacky things that can grow, yeah. you know, yeah. not the perfect red apple, you know, and eggs don't have to be white. And, you know, there are just so many. So I think all of that was kind of brewing and, um, it, mm, Ooh, the the um, the interaction with clay happened when a friend in one of my play groups. So moms get together and they kind of share their kids and their stories of raising children. And um, one of them said, "Hey, let's take a get out of the house. Let's mm -hmm. let's take up some ceramics." So um, I took a class at the Davis Art Center, and it was like, "Oh my God." This is what I want to do. And it enabled me, I found right away, to tell stories, to draw into my interests in art history, art, um, you know, um, also um, music. So I was able to um, bring in lots of different things and, and express myself in this one medium. Mm -hmm. So it was like all encompassing. And I think what drew me to clay is this, just this raw element that comes from the earth that, um, you know, is, it's been around since the beginning of time. Yes. It's what enabled civilizations to develop. Mm -hmm. And uh, so there's this amazing history to ceramics. Yeah. And so as I got to become more familiar with the medium, you know, and it responds to your touch. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like... Instant gratification, yes. It's, it's like your best <laughs> yeah. lover, you know? It'll like always respond to how you, you yeah. feel, you know? And so it just draws you in. And I realized, you know, uh, unlike sitting in front of a piano, which, you know, for hours on end in one place, um, it just enabled my mind to go to travel. And, and so, um, 
Yeah, I um, immediately, once I started getting my hands and realizing I could do something with it and, um, and express myself um, when I was uh, going through, you know, just the, the throngs of motherhood, you know, difficulties with my marriage and um, so it got me out of the house. It got me into a different space. Mm -hmm. It wasn't all focused on the kids. Yeah. And uh, so I started when my son was six months old. Mm -hmm. I started at that point. Um, I stopped um, designing because mm -hmm. I had been working part time um, in in graphic design. The last project I did was I designed a book on Gil Hooley for John Nettsoulis. Oh, excellent. There you go. Both <laughs> of you just know who that is. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, and so uh, I started taking classes at Sac State mm -hmm. with Bob Brady and Peter Vandenberg, um, Steve Kaltenbach, Bill Allen, and I started showing right away. And before I knew it, um, I had uh, my first solo show uh, at John Natsoulis, I believe, in 97 or 98. Mm -hmm. and, um, and how did your MFA work or sort of more structured academic pursuits um, uh, affect your later work? Or what, what concepts were you exploring in your MFA work that you either continued throughout your, your career mm -hmm. or solely abandoned? Sort of, you know. Uh, just looking at comparing an academic environment versus sort of, you know. Yeah, when we start yeah. looking at some images, yes. um, you'll see that my, so my, um, my career, I, I became a, um, separated uh, and um, so I was a single mom raising my kids. Uh, they were really into music and so I was actually there. Um, we were an ensemble, the Fitzgibbon uh, Trio and um, so at the same time, I was producing artwork and having exhibitions every two years with John Natsoulis up through 2006. So um, my train of thought, MFA did not happen until after. Oh, yeah. The, so you were in the throngs of your career and then sort of. Way, way later. Yeah. So I had um, yeah. my MFA. Um, really, what brought me to do that to mm -hmm. to um, in my in my MFA, I feel like was um, a deep dive, like therapy. Mm -hmm. That's what it made me figure out what what it was that that um, that drew me to. Mm -hmm. Like you asked, you know, what drew me to to make art and yeah. become an artist. So it wasn't after I had my kids that I felt like I I had the strength to become an artist, so I credit my being a mother, and then um, my MFA ha um, happened after I did a two and a half month long residency at Anderson Branch, mm -hmm. and even though I was committed to making art, but it real I realized at that point I needed to take the next step. Mm -hmm. So I had never really officially studied ceramics except for a few mm -hmm. classes, um, open university at CSUS. I didn't study ceramics in college. In fact, I only took one year of drawing. So, you know, in a way, I'm, I'm sort of self-trained. Um, and, and then um, I spent that residency, came back, had a show at, at uh, Scott DeCaro. I also had a show at the Pence Gallery, a, a large solo show. And um, so my kids had left. In, I embarked on an MFA, um, which was a low residency out of Boston. Mm -hmm. And um, that was 2011. So I got my MFA in 2013. Mm -hmm. And I had started showing professionally in 1998 or even before that in a few places. So, um, yeah, and how did it, it really altered my work. Mm -hmm. And um, in that deep dive, it kind of pushed me over the edge and helped me to explore, you know, what it really, what were the, what was the motivation to create besides the storytelling. Um, and you'll see through the different bodies of work that we'll look at um, this, uh, not just motherhood, 
but there's always been this underlying um, desire to talk about life's destructive forces as well of, as creative forces and, and, and this idea of beauty that and, and nature um, which comes out in the produce that I might um, try to create and um, so these conflicting um, uh, forces. Forces, thank yeah. you. Yeah, uh, uh, and so one of my first, after you know, starting out doing work based on themes of music and mm -hmm. um, food yeah. and produce, um, having run across the artist Archimboldo, who was a big influence on me, mm -hmm. um, and, and Richard Shaw in the way that he combines different parts to make a whole. I started creating figures based on um, you know, food or uh, started t telling stories um, based on musical themes like the Flying Dutchman or mm -hmm. Liebestod from Wagner's Tristan and Isolde, um, tied into literature. And then I, I started stepping on my work and running motorcycle tires <laughs> across my work. And I started tearing in and becoming fascinated by things that, yeah, so maybe you so want to look at, do we a, have cups runneth over? We do, hold on just a um, second. And so that came kind of an underlying part of, um, of, of the work. So yeah, I'm, I'm often, so there we have fire and brimstone where you can see this, in terms of scale is the cup is about this big. A lot of my work hangs on the wall. Um, I'm also dealing with the tension of the display. You know, is, it's kind of leering out at you. Is that cup going to fall off the wall and crash? Actually, one of my cups did that. <laughs> um, so, so, you know, I push it to the point where things are cracking. Um, and the color scheme of this relates to my interest in um, medieval illumination. So these clashes of color, which are also um, kind of fighting each other along with the destruction. So there's this abstraction that, that comes out of the things that flow out of the cups that you'll then, when you see my work that I created for my MFA, which is um, completely abstract, <laughs> Uh, you'll see where that is really, that flow is coming from. Let's take a look at sort of that comparison, right? Yeah. There's, this is abstraction in the sense of, right, you're taking, you're taking ceramic elements and you're stretching them and removing them from a context, right? Abstraction mm -hmm. is sort of, you know, taking a step back, right? Just looking at form or color or, right, these notions versus something representational. Um, and it's always really interesting to me if you've seen Linda's work, for the most part, especially with the fruit, it's identifiable. You can be like, oh, I have a, you know, a reference point for this. Um, this is why I asked about the MFA work, because I feel like when you go into you know, a program, they tend, you, you, you push your own perceptions and your own boundaries um, regarding you know, other people's artwork, your own artwork. And so going into um, this particular body of work, um, is there is there something that you were sort of, that, what, what was your process for sort of pushing yourself and going outside of your own um, boundaries or, or concepts? So just wanna, I basically wanna draw the contrast between sort of more representational, right? Cups runneth over, right? You've got, um, you have some abstraction that's happening, mm -hmm. but sort of going going even further with the abstraction, so. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think this may have been the first work of abstraction that I created in my MFA, and I had been doing inflatables, so we'll have to switch, um, which came about um, from the desire to express this feeling of being deflated. Mm -hmm. So, you know, with clay and the vessel, there's, which is another thing I love about clay, is this relationship to the earth. And um, a vessel is a container that breathes. 
So um, when I embarked upon the inflatables, it was like just perfect symbol because it showed I could I could deflate it, I could um, mimic it, but um, it's light. It's all the things that clay is not, is not. Yeah. Um, and it and it it breathes because it's full of air, just like. Um, a vessel is full of air. So there's, you know, I've been doing cups. I've been, a lot of my work was based on the vessel. And then you can see Wedgwood here. I started um, drawing upon um, the history of ceramics and using that as a staging ground um, and got interested in this idea of, you know, service, of motherhood, of, um, you know, when I was growing up in high school, we took um, home ec. We had to take classes on cooking, and, and I was already kind of drawn to, to that kind of thing, but it's this placement of, of women in the home and raising children and, and the fragility. So clay is fragile, and it breaks, you know? And, and especially China. Um, my, so my work is, I purposefully choose not to work with porcelain, but to work with earthenware, which is cruder. And I think that's partly because I'm not trying to make this, even though it's a replica, I'm not trying to make it look like it came from a mold. Everything is hand built laboriously so. <laughs> All of the texture is carved. Yeah. Everything starts um, from the hand. Um, and if you've been over to the, the show, you'll see the scale of these things are blown up much in the way um, pop art is expanded. You know, another influence is in addition to, you know, maybe Warhol might be um, Oldenburg and his giant hamburgers and, and toilets and soft toilets, in yeah. fact. So you can see that kind of use of the inflatable ties into maybe what, where uh, Oldenburg was going with his work. So um, I'm going to take a step back and explain to everybody what um, uh, Wedgwood Liberty Ware <laughs> is. So essentially, um, during the late 1800s, Right, you had the creation of the ceramic studio and, and, and molds, right? So you could mass produce porcelain and sort of finer, um, finer sets of, of china that were previously only available to the to you know the aristocracy, right? And so mm -hmm. now you had sort of the middle class that could purchase a really nice set of dishware, right? So it mm -hmm. sort of democratized ceramics in a way. Um, and created created a process of, of making something that looked very refined, right? So you have this like status symbol in your home that um, that that represented a certain level of class or aristocracy. So what I love is is taking that concept of something that is very elitist, right? Working with it literally, right? Like like <laughs> like you said, you can see the, the hands in the clay. And, and reinterpreting it, looking at it in a different way that um, sort of decontextualizes that socio-cultural aspect. And so what we tried to do with the exhibit is really um, put these pieces within a historical context that will allow people to look at it differently, right? So previously, we would take a look at, you know, at uh, uh, Willowware or, um, or Wedgwood and say like, oh, isn't this a fancy British vase or cup or whatever it is, right? And so we're bringing it into a more American context, a more rural context, a more sort of um, democratic, right, perception. Um, and also to, to tie back into running things over, right, recontextualizing them, having the experience of history sort of run through us and what does that, um, what does that, look like now, mm -hmm. right? Through your own personal lens of, right? Yeah, so of, I of did yep. run myself <laughs> over and one of those paint brushes is broken and dripping red glaze, which is kind of like blood. Um, and all of that sprigging, it's really not mold sprigging. That's all hand molded, all of the white on top of the blue. But the thing about this piece is it's quite large 
whereas Wedgwood is often petite and and like something you just put in a cupboard and yeah, never even and never use. Again. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So um, it's taking it its preciousness out of it, and um, and that's intention. Yeah. And so with uh, getting back to the MFA, so where I was going was um, with that work is I wanted to make it uh, less of an object. I wanted to make work that could be in, encountered uh, that you could relate to in a scale of, you know, one-on-one um, -on -one that didn't need a white pedestal to be installed. Mm -hmm. um, and so we were looking at the piece on the wall um, yeah. yeah, and it, there are references to, yes, clay is, once it's fired, it's hard, and, um, but I try to make it look like it's molten or malleable and, and flowing, so it, it's called mirage because when you come up to this piece and you look at the mirror, it, it gives you an optical illusion that it's actually flowing through. Mm -hmm. And um, you can't really see on the slide, but there are some pins and needles um, sticking down that are reflected and astroturf. So you can see in this work, I began mixing in other media. So it made me question, why am I making my MFA? Mm -hmm. Why am I making replicas of things? Why don't I just stick the thing in the piece? Why do I feel this desire? So it really made me question you know, what I was doing and, um, and why I was doing it and loosened me up a little, shook me up, you know? It, it's kind of, that's what therapy does, I think. I've yeah. actually never been through therapy, but, but uh, art, thing was right, therapy. right, right. But art in a way is my therapy, yes. right? Yes. So, um, yeah. I don't know where we're going to go yeah. from there. But uh, um, I was mentioning body. So if you look at the uh, the other piece mm -hmm. that um, we just had up, oh, the this pink one. one. Oh, the yeah. So uh, I was thinking about, now you wouldn't know, know this, but I was thinking about having read Dante's Inferno and different levels of purgatory. So I was trying to um, show that and show the piece flowing through, but also feeling constricted, um, it, which is what these, these um, metal rods are. So I'm working with wood and metal, uh, well, having pieces welded for me, mm -hmm. and creating it to flow. There are wounds evident uh, in there, and cut marks, and, um, you know, interestingly enough, so I, I um, Another thing that happened in my life is I was diagnosed with breast cancer the fall after I graduated with my MFA. Yeah. And it's almost as if it, it, it was prescient, you know, mm -hmm. it's almost as if I knew that was coming when I look at that work now mm -hmm. in, in retrospect. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, so there's still a lot of the same forces involved with the abstraction, but, um, but it's not as literal. Yeah. And so where does that leave me? I feel like I'm kind of <laughs> in two places and sometimes, but in a way I was already, my work was, you know, I had those cups runneth over that were just expressive with the clay, and then I had the more literal Trump Law pieces, mm -hmm. and um, Let's see. Uh, yeah, and and there's humor yeah. in that work too, yeah. which maybe not so much comes in through the abstraction. Um, so I'm still making this work mm -hmm. because it's still a part of me, and I feel it's important. Was this um, sort of more tied to your kids and motherhood? Yes, and absolutely. That that's, yeah, that's so space. So we can maybe talk a little bit about sort of you know how um, this is also in the show, right? The, mm -hmm. the concept of motherhood or toys or right, Incor and incorporating other media into into your um, your work. Do you want to talk a little bit about this piece because this is also sure. Yeah. So yeah. Um, I, I want to just mention that the residencies were um, I've done three so far and. They have really, in addition to my MFA, have helped me push myself on um, just having that experience, 
help me push myself to a different point in my bodies of work. So um, the, the very first Wedgwood was right before I went to um, Anderson Ranch. And then when I was there, because there wasn't any fresh produce, mm -hmm. I was working with like maybe moldy things and Wedgwood. Um, and I created in the course of two months, like five or six finished pieces, including that large uh, plate with my grandmother's <coughs> glove that you've yes. looked at. Um, so this one was created in Vermont 2017. And um, the, uh, you can see I've stepped on the uh, Willow Wear pitcher. It's called Land of Milk and Honey. And it's about, you know, just the innocence of childhood. Um, it's about um, also the violence and, and the toys. Um, growing up playing cowboys and Indians as a kid and, you know, having these representations of, of violence that I, I see, we see more and more in our culture that I just feel the desire to call out. Um, and so, you know, there, there's this, this almost uh, genderless astro boy who is... He's got flames on his legs, and he's he's um, just rocketing out of this pitcher. But it's about that kind of idea of when you're raising your kids, you're not thinking about you know all of the challenges of the world, and um, when you're young, and so you know there's this purity um, that I wanted to capture, but also the sense of, of violence. And um, so, so I thought we could sort of shift the conversation to talk a little bit about curation at this point, right? Mm. That's sort of my <laughs> um, Linda does sure. a lot of obviously curating of her own work, right? She has this large body of work, and so, right? How do you um, arrange it? How do you, you know, create, um, you know, narratives around it? Um, and so, what are what are your considerations when um, when curating? a show essentially either you know within within the context of um, of other people's artwork and then as well as as your own yeah that's a, g a good question i um i've come to curating just in the last few years um and i've actually been a collector of other people's other artists artwork longer than i've been an artist so in a way, I've always been kind of curating the space of my home and my own artwork. Mm -hmm. And um, so the question was... So considerations in terms of, of curation. Right. Um, I so, think we mentioned it's sort of like orchestration in music. Yeah, yeah. So I, I was given the opportunity to curate an exhibition at the college where I teach, which is Cosumnes River College, and we have this amazing 2,500 square foot um, gallery that's state of the art. And um, I had actually been thinking about this idea since before, that was 2019, I would say it probably came up around 2017 of uh, empathy and you know, just feeling in society that we really needed more empathy um, and understanding of each other, that we becoming so with um, politics, such a divided community that um, I, I approached that topic a drawing from mainly um, local artists that I felt had, um, had those elements in their and diverse artists mm -hmm. uh, in their artwork and um, so I think putting a show together made me feel brings brought me back to the idea of creating music which was such an important part of my my life in the beginning and and I did feel like in a way not that I conducted before but I've done ensemble work that when you're bringing other artworks together into a space, you're staging it 
and, and allowing it to reverberate in that space like a musical composition. Mm -hmm. So, um, and, and then since that time, um, I created as another show, uh, curated another show on the theme of identity, which is another, I think, important social theme. Um, so having a gallery or a space is a way to draw attention and to, to make, you know, hopefully, help visitors to not, not tell them what to see, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but help them create a dialogue um, within the artwork in the gallery. What do you think are some barriers to curation or um, true expression in terms of being able to show artists' work um, and sort of the, where, the, the challenges essentially that, that exist for you in your sort of in, at the moment in curation? Oh. Or where do you see opportunities? I should say I mean, <laughs> challenges slash opportunities is usually how uh, we you know, catch things these days. Yes. Um, well, you know, it, you have to, I would imagine, you can come up with a theme for a show, but you really have to think about the space that it's going to be exhibited in. Mm -hmm. And um, so I'm fairly new to this, mm -hmm. this uh, role, and so um, I can give an example of a barrier in that uh, at the campus, they've decided um, not to allow cars to enter campus mm -hmm. anymore. And so I'm thinking if I'm going to create another show uh, curate another show on campus, how is that going to affect the scale of work if you can't drive a vehicle onto the <laughs> campus? Um, so, you know, you're, you're somewhat limited. Um, also, I, I ran into a major challenge of uh, having work shipped to the gallery. Uh, so a curator um, needs to consider uh, the cost of of moving that artwork and the scale of that, and you know, which, so I naively chose a piece by Wan Zing Zhang that was um, larger than life human figure, not realizing that it would have to be professionally moved at four thousand yeah. dollars a shot, which of course our budget did not <laughs> allow. So luckily, I was able to. Um, find a, still a very large head, which I, th I think was the, um, the grand um, you know, way it really drew you into the gallery. It, it placed yeah. the show. Um, so considering how, how the work is in installation is once you choose the work, how is it going to be laid out? Those are challenges. Um, and I think some of that is intuitive. Um, and uh, some of it is just based on on the space. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in this particular gallery at yeah. the Gibson House, um, you know, how did you approach the the placement of the work? So the the Gibson House is a unique space in that it's a historic home, and there's a lot that is sort of you know. The, the limitations are essentially right. The wall space, the construction, mm -hmm. and um, you know, wallpaper, wallpaper, <laughs> weight bearing of the floors. Everything is you know so precarious. So there was yeah. really this thought of um, you know the pieces that we need to hang have to be very light. The, um, the the pedestals need to support the pieces. Well, we can't have oversized items. So I feel like you're mm -hmm. right. There's always the context of the space that you're working within. Mm -hmm. And then how the additional thing for me is how is that perceived, right? It's such a busy space. If you've been in there, right, like you said, the wallpaper is a major factor. We have, you know, larger pieces like the piano that can't be moved. So the, the interaction of pieces within that space don't lend themselves to the white walls that we have, right, in a gallery where it's essentially mm -hmm. a blank page. So it was really interesting for me when I stepped into it, I assumed that most artists would want, you know, a blank page, but you very much were like, no, I want, you know, the historic tables and I want that textural element 
um, within uh, within that space to be in conversation with the artwork. So I very much appreciated <laughs> that openness because it is it is a whole other um, setting, like you said. Mm -hmm. It is you're working within the space, you're working within the confines of the space, and um, we're also working with a very specific time period, right? Late like, uh, 1800s, early 1900s. So. Um, yeah, it's always it's always interesting to and then how people are going to perceive that, mm -hmm. right? How are people going to look at all of those elements? How do you interpret each of those elements and then provide um, information regarding regarding that? Um, and like you said, the theme the theme is always the driving mm -hmm. force, right? If you have a strong theme, and I think we very much had right historic and contemporary ceramics yeah. were a really good fit for that space, and we had contemporary artists that were absolutely eager mm -hmm. to. <laughs> engage in that, that dialogue with historic items. So yeah, I, I yeah. have another um, idea yeah. for yeah. an exhibition yeah, I might absolutely. throw out and, yeah. and that because I'm interested in food mm -hmm. and um, food there's such a tie to culture yeah. and um, memory you know your your mother's cooking you know my family's from Italy so you know I'm really drawn to the, the smells and the, the look and the, t you know, all of that will bring you back to a different mm -hmm. time. And so I'm wondering if there might be a way to do an exhibition in the Gibson House yeah. that would be based on, you know, we have such a rich cultural identity in this area. Yeah. Um, artists and food and, and then maybe, um, you know, there could be actual food dishes served um, yeah the multi-sensory sensory experience absolutely. right right yeah yeah and so i'm gonna i'm gonna bring it back to you as, a, as an artist what mm -hmm. makes you take that creative leap or what so let's say right you have the idea of food what what mm -hmm. materializes it how do you you know sort of take a concept that maybe just is sort of a fly-by-night idea and then really work with it, work with the clay, work with it, right, mm -hmm. through models. And so that, yeah. that arc of, of creativity that actually produces a, a body of work, what mm. is sort of what is, what is that like for you? Is it in fits and starts? Is it all at once? Do you stay up until three in the morning? <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, um, Devin will attest that uh, a number of <laughs> You know, I'll be out shopping at the, at, you know, the farmer's market or the, the, the food co-op where I get a lot of my produce and I'll come across a really unusually shaped pro piece of produce. Doesn't that look like something? So it will trigger yeah. the form, uh, the beauty, the color, the texture. Yeah. Um, and then it'll go into my refrigerator and it will start to mold. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, you know, but then, you know, it, so it makes, so often I will gather some things and I'll, you know, especially think about, well, we were looking yeah. at spuds up or, um, or I, I had a, um, a squash. I don't know whether I gave you, um, there you go. Okay. Well, so that's a potato and from a real potato in Mr. Potato Head's pants. And I was thinking about those pants look like, mm -hmm. you know, when my son was a teenager, the, it was style to wear the, the saggy pants, you know, and the Nike shoes, and there's a stud in the tongue. And I mean, I remember playing with, you know, that's like a cubist thing. When you're a kid, you're doing Picasso with that Mr. Potato, you yeah. know, head. So, um, but the, uh, there's also the screen um, where, where I cut open the papaya and it looked like, it like, just, yeah. like I felt when I was yelling at my son mm -hmm. um, and, you know, thinking about Monk and, um, and kids' drawings with the, the arms coming out of the head. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. So you see reflections so, of our history, right, within your day to day. I mean, right, like this would be, this is that, a trip to the grocery store, but right, right. right. <laughs> positioned correctly. So that's kind yeah. of how that, do, and then I start looking for other elements to pull it together. Mm -hmm. So I think it's in a way, it's like editing a poem. Yeah. You know, you have these little phrases and then these ideas, and then you start working with them. Mm -hmm. And then, so I'll, I work from nature, mm -hmm. you know, I'd much rather hold it in my hand than work from a photograph of something. So I'm trying to capture all of the, like, the, you know, defects 
the the weird things about about it it's not like the perfect banana it's starting to ripen mm -hmm. and that's the thing about nature that you can express in art this passing of time mm -hmm. even though it's still you know it's it's still it's 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 going towards decay just like we are you know yeah. so there's this sense of humanity. Do you, do you think there's the push pull like you said that there's such a permanence to ceramics, right? Mm -hmm. And you're and you're looking at concepts of decay with an item that essentially will be around, I'm saying forever because we still find pottery shards and, you know, like uh, burial tombs and things like that. So, yeah. um, sort of chemically, it is a very strong bond mm -hmm. and then, right, you're sort of playing with that notion of deterioration and permanence. Mm -hmm. um, within within the artwork. Which yeah. Means. So I'll stage yeah. it, and then mm -hmm. I'll um, often, especially with the larger pieces, I'll do a maquette mm -hmm. uh, so that I can work out the balance and just a rough sketch. Um, I can get really into the detail, which um, can sometimes make something look stiff. Mm -hmm. So if I work from a maquette that I've whipped together. I can look back at that and reflect on it and try to make some of that looseness come out in the final piece. So um, a maquette is, is an, uh, often a, an important part. And then the color, oh, I just, it's like icing on a cake. <laughs> I just love, you know, building up the color. Um, for me, it's multiple firings in and out of the kiln. Um, often I, I uh, will just, keep on pushing it until I just can't, um, <laughs> and then it's done. <laughs> I love it. So this will be our, our final question, then we'll open it up to the audience for some questions. Um, and, uh, what is your legacy as an artist, or what would you like your legacy as an artist to be? You know, I've been thinking a lot, of, that's a, a really good question. Um, as, as we age, you know, and you know, you, you have all of this baggage in the way of artwork that is going to be left behind. Um, and what is my legacy? I don't think so much of it as an artist. I think more of it as I, I hope my legacy is, is that um, is through my kids and um, my teaching. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I just hope I can bring a positive something positive to this world that is is undergoing such stresses you know um that's how i want to live on and i you know i don't care so much about where the work ends up and if it you know what do you do with it it's it's like all those clothes in your closet you know um so yeah i mean i really think if if i can have a legacy, I would want it to be through what I've, I've left other people to think about or um, encounter or, you know, an idea I might have um, helped a student find themselves, uh, maybe not necessarily in clay, but realize that you know, they can become more sensitive to the world around them. And that's what I think, you know, the power of art is. I talk about that a lot in my classes. You know, art is just so important mm -hmm. um, as, a, as a, a way, to, not just of expression, but of understanding the world and your place in it. Mm -hmm. Lovely. So. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> sure. Thank you.